add on to that today. So I'm just going to briefly um, redraw it. I think we had like cerebrum over here. And then we had diencephalon. And so that's where we're picking up today with the diencephalon. So you can add on to the same one that you started or you can create a new one. It's totally up to you. Um, there's three major lo uh, locations or three major features of the, the diencephalon. So your PowerPoint and your book list for subthalamus isn't something that we're going to review. You just need to know the first three, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. So you can cross off subthalamus from your notes. So we'll talk about the thalamus to start. So the thalamus is our major sensory relay center. This is where all of your sensory information goes. You feel something, it's because it passed through your thalamus and then went up to your primary sensory cortex, right? So anything that goes up to your primary sensory cortex on your cerebrum, pass through your thalamus. Anything that you see, anything that you hear, passed through your thalamus before it went to your primary uh, you know, auditory association area or your visual association area, right? So the thalamus is your relay center. The thalamus also decides what is important enough for you to be aware of and what can be ignored, right? So remember, you're getting, your brain is getting all of the sensory information coming into it all at once. The way your shoes feel, your blood pH, right? The, the shirt touching your back right, the actual sensation of the pen in your hand, right, all of those things are coming in and going to your thalamus, and your thalamus has to decide what is important enough for you to be consciously aware of and what can be ignored, right. So your thalamus is probably saying, yeah, it doesn't quite matter that um, the pants are touching my legs right now, right, so we're going to ignore the fact that your pants are touching your legs, but we're going to listen to what Jamie has to say, or we're gonna pay attention to the words that we're writing down, right, or the words that we see on the board. So your thalamus does that. Your thalamus decides, because all of your sensory information goes there, and then your thalamus can say, okay, this is important, this is important, this doesn't matter, this doesn't matter, this doesn't matter. Okay, your thalamus does that, this deciding piece. So it kind of looks like a little egg. Um, I think of the diencephalon itself as kind of like this inner lollipop of the brain, there's the brain stem that we'll get to eventually, and then this kind of lollipop piece of the brain stem. And so it's up and it's underneath of the cerebrum. So you won't see the diencephalon if I just put a brain in front of you. The only way you're gonna see the thalamus and the other diencephalon structures is if you pull the brain apart and look inside of it, because it's all deep. So the thalamus is controlling which things are important enough to go up to the cortex, which things can be um, ignored. So there's specific nuclei in our thalamus that are going to do that. Remember, our nuclei is a group of cell bodies in the central nervous system. So there's specialized nuclei that do this. The specialized nuclei can sense, detect, monitor specific things that are going on in your body. So there's also association nuclei. Association nuclei are associated with different things in your body, like emotions, memory, right? This is why sometimes you'll see something, oh, what is this black thing, right? You see it, you're processing it, and your thalamus helps you remember that this shape is a stapler, right? So your thalamus is, is making those connections for you. Right? as well as your, your servants, bringing that information up, saying, hey, we know what this black thing is, let's send it up to the cerebrum, and the cerebrum can identify it as a stapler. Right? So your thalamus helps with that. It's called an association nuclei. So specialized nuclei and association nuclei. For memory, etc. There's other non-specific nuclei that are within our thalamus, things that are controlling our consciousness and our level of responsiveness. So whether or not you're, you're kind of awake or whether or not you're kind of dozing off, some of that is regulated in parts of the thalamus. And we'll look at that as we go. There's different uh, functional groups in the brain that do this. The hypothalamus, also part of our diencephalon. Mm -hmm. Try to alternate colors here. All I got is black and red. So 
show our hypothalamus. This is our major uh, homeostasis center, hypothalamus. When you think hypothalamus, you should think of the word homeostasis. So this is where our blood sugar is monitored. This is where our uh, body temperature is monitored. This is where our hormone levels are monitored. This, this is where a lot of those basic things that need to, to be maintained are regulated, right? So our sleep-wake cycle. This is also a, a key player between our endocrine system and our nervous system. So this is going to kind of be, play an integral role, allowing the two systems to communicate together. So there's the inferior hypothalamus, which releases uh, these hormones called releasing and inhibiting hormones. So we'll talk about these more at the end of the semester when we do the endocrine system. So they have releasing and inhibiting hormones coming from the hypothalamus. Um, there's a stalk hanging off of the hypothalamus called the infundibulum that's linking the pituitary gland to the brain. Um, and the pituitary gland is the master gland in the body, which is again why the hypothalamus plays such a huge role in linking our endocrine system and nervous system together. We'll look at that more when we get there. But again, this is our thirst, our hunger, our sleep-wake cycles, all of the stuff that keeps us alive and keeps us balanced. Body temperature, right? I think I went the wrong way there. There we go. Um, our hypothalamus actually does release a few hormones. Antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin come from the hypothalamus. They're released from the posterior pituitary, but they're produced in the hypothalamus. So we'll, again, come back and revisit this when we do the endocrine system. We're just glazing over it. This won't be on the test yet. This will be on the last test when we talk about hormones. There's something called the mammillary bodies that are associated with our hypothalamus. Our mammillary bodies which kind of sounds like mammillary glands, right? So they're called mammillary bodies. You'll see this on the models in lab. They kind of look like breast tissue, so that's why they're, they're called that. Um, they're actually related to um, feeding reflexes, um, things that are uh, like, a, like related to swallowing and eating um, is, a, is a lot of what the mammillary bodies are linked to. And they're also connecting um, eating with emotions. So one of the reasons eating ice cream, you know, makes you happy or, you know, eating fried foods makes you happy or whatever, right, is because the mammillary bodies kind of link those feeding reflexes with your limbic system, which is your happiness and your emotions and things like that. Um, your, your mammillary bodies can also uh, have a role in body temperature as well. The epithalamus, so again, we're crossing off the subthalamus here, but the epithalamus is the last little piece of our diencephalon. And this piece is connected to another gland called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland secretes melatonin. So again, a, a lot of this area is linked to hormones, and we'll explore these hormones like melatonin when we do the endocrine system. So we're just going to note it for now and kind of sit it on the shelf and come back to it. But there's the entire diencephalon. You can see how I'm kind of calling it a lollipop, right? It's like a stick with a ball on the end of it. Um, and that's located up and inside the brain. You can't see it from the outside. You can see the cerebellum from the outside of the brain, though. The cerebellum is the little walnut that hangs off the back of the brain. So your cerebellum is divided into hemispheres, just like your cerebrum. And I think briefly before, we said your cerebellum is for balance, and that's 100% right. It's for balance and equilibrium. Um, it is divided into two hemispheres. Um, and here, there's a, a major relay center. So when we're saying relay center, you should think of like wires passing through it. A lot of things pass through the cerebellum. Um, because a lot of things will affect our balance, right? Um, how we're walking, how we're standing, how we're sitting, all of that body position <coughs> stuff is, is going to be relayed and directed to our cerebellum. So our cerebellum knows exactly where our body is, and then it can communicate with the cerebrum to say, you know what, we're, we're falling right now, so our primary motor cortex needs to extend our arm so we can catch ourselves. 
right? So the cerebellum is going to be a major relay center for, for body positioning and, and that type of balance type stuff. So there it is. It, again, it's like a walnut that hangs off the back of the brain. You'll see these in lab next week when we get to take a look at them. You don't have to know the lobes that are associated with it, but you should be familiar with the fact that there is a cerebellar cortex. So just like the cerebrum, which had a cerebral cortex, our cerebellum has a cerebellar cortex. The cortex is just the outer covering, right, just the outer covering. And inside and kind of embedded within the outer covering is something called the arbor vitae which literally looks like a little white tree. It's white fibers that are kind of tree-shaped inside, arbor vitae. And these are just the white tracks, right? So these are just the white fibers that pass through. So whereas most of our brain is gray matter on the outside and white matter on the inside, our cerebellum follows the same pattern. Gray matter on the outside, white matter on the inside. And the white matter on the inside looks like a tree. We call it the arbor vitae. So this is that cortex, um, and this is the arbor vitae, that inner, <coughs> inner tree branch. So this is where all of that, that balancing and processing takes place. Now we move on to the last piece of the brain, which is our brain stem. And the brain stem has three major parts. Uh, the brain stem has our um, uh, a parts called our pons, our medulla oblongata, uh, part, another part called the midbrain, all involved in the brainstem. So when you think of the brainstem, you should be thinking of things that keep us alive. These are the basics of, of being alive. This is heart rate, digestion rate, respiration rate. As we move up in the brain, Right? Then we start to balance, then we maintain homeostasis and have some feelings and some hormones and some regulation. Then in our cerebrum we have this conscious awareness and control and logic and prediction. Right? So the higher up in the brain you go, the more complex things are. This brainstem piece is very rudimentary. It's very much the basics. So this is reflexes, right? just basic keeping you alive. Right? This is also maintaining alertness, being awake. Right? heart rate, breathing rhythms, all those things are right here in the brainstem. So this is a nice cross section. It's like we took the two hemispheres and we took one of the hemispheres off. So we're looking at the sagittal section of the brain here. You see the cerebrum, this white edge here, whoops. That white edge there is that corpus callosum, those fibers that connect the two hemispheres together. You see the diencephalon in the middle. This whole kind of chunky piece here is our brainstem and on the back, we have our cerebellum. So again, the most basic functions are down here on the brainstem, the more complex as we go up. That's an actual picture of an actual brain. You can see they look very, very similar, right? The models and the brain are pretty spot on. So let's talk about um, the parts of our, of our brainstem. So first of all, there is something called a reticular formation in our um, brainstem. The reticular formation is parts of all of the brainstem parts. So it's kind of like pulling a little bit from the pons, pulling a little bit from the medulla oblongata, and creating this thing called the reticular formation. So I'm going to kind of write it up here to the side. The reticular formation, this is a lot of our um, basic, again, basic rudimentary things. This is our alertness and our awakeness and our responsiveness to things. Can our heart adjust its heart rate when you stand up or lay down, right? Can your blood pressure change, right? The reticular formation is monitoring that and, and keeping um, tabs on that. Um, there's also cranial nerves that come off of our brain stem. So the reticular formation is kind of conscious. Uh, just kidding, nothing's conscious down here. Subconscious. control, and our cranial nerves, our nerves that come directly off of the brain. There's 12 pairs of them. You'll know them eventually. But those come off of the brainstem area. And 
all of the tracts of white matter all pass through this area. And in, in other words, in order to get up to the thalamus or the hypothalamus or the cerebrum, those impulses have to go through the brainstem. There's no other way into the brain other than through the brainstem. So the brainstem is like a major roadway, right? This is just another view looking at it. Let's talk about the midbrain. Again, this is part of the brainstem. So we have the midbrain. It's a physical structure. You can point to it, label it, identify it. You will be able to do that eventually. This is where, um, <coughs> can tell us on this slide, here we go. This is where some of our auditory and visual reflexes are. Auditory and visual reflexes are in the midbrain. And so, what I mean by auditory and visual reflexes are if someone were to come into the back of the room really loud and drop something or bang something, right, we would all turn and look, right? That's a reflex. It's a, it's a reflex to, to do that. Um, if someone were to throw something right at your face, your reflex is to blink and turn away, right? You might not reach, have the hand-eye coordination like me. I don't have the hand-eye coordination to reach up and try to catch it. So it's definitely going to hit me in the head. But I'll at least blink and try to close my eyes. That's done at the midbrain. The midbrain is those reflexes. So there's a structure called the superior and inferior colliculi. Um, it's part of this, this region um, called the corpora quadrigemina. We'll look at all of this in lab when, when we get to looking at the brain. But there's these little bumps. And those are the ones that are in control and regulating these auditory and visual reflexes. There's something called the substantia nigra and the red nucleus. The substantia nigra, this is going to work with those basal nuclei for those background patterns of movement. Again, uh, nigra meaning kind of the, it's darker pigmented, right, like black. And that's what those basal nuclei are. They're these like dark pieces of brain tissue embedded in the cerebrum. And then the red nucleus is regulating movement. And there's not a whole lot known about that nuclei either. Oops. That was on me. All right, um, you don't have to know the midbrain tegmentum. It's just a connection piece. Um, all right, the pons. So the pons is the next lowest structure. So the midbrain is just below the thalamus. We're going lower and lower. Our pons is the next lowest piece. This is our major respiratory place. Uh, respiratory regulation is the major um, name of the game in the pons. So your breathing rates to inhale, to exhale, all of that is all done here in the pons. The pons also has the reticular formation and cranial nerves, right? Just like the midbrain had parts of the reticular formation and cranial nerves, the pons has parts of the reticular formation and cranial nerves. So this is, again, breathing and, and any movements related to breathing, right? So actually inhaling contracting those inhalation muscles, contracting the exhalation muscles if it's a forceful exhalation, sleeping, right, controlling your breathing rates while you're sleeping, controlling your breathing rates while you're exercising, um, all of that, all done in the pons. Finally, the medulla oblongata. I'm just going to abbreviate it MO because I'm running out of room over here. This is our basic heart rate, HR and blood pressure regulation. So again, the lower we are in the brain, the more basic the functions are. Medulla oblongata is just telling that heart to beat, right? Pons, just telling the lungs to breathe, right? Just keep us alive, keep the blood flowing, right? There's sections of the medulla oblongata called pyramids. The pyramids are just specialized cells that are motor neurons. They're motor neurons that are going down and controlling the heart, Right? They're motor neurons that are going down and controlling different parts of our digestive system because the medulla oblongata has that basic role of just keeping us alive. You could be a vegetable, but your medulla oblongata is still going to be working. Right? So you don't have to know the different um, nuclei, but you should understand this word, discuss discussate, which basically means they cross over everything crosses from one side to the other side. There's very few exceptions to that rule. So motor control, those motor commands coming down from the right um, motor cortex, the right side of the motor cortex is controlling the left side of the body, and vice versa. Same thing with sensory. Sensory information crosses over as well. What was your question? Um, what is 
the reticular formation subconsciously control it. So this is kind of your alertness, your ability to respond, um, your awakeness. So there's a, a lot of pieces to that, but your your ability to regulate things. So it's it's a general general response function. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. Okay. So um, you don't have to know the olive, the olivary nuclei, all of those things. Sorry, I thought I deleted that out. Um, so this is just showing you a cross section. So the big idea here. This is our medulla oblongata. You see all of these different colored sections, right? Those are groups of cell bodies that control different areas of your basic living things, right? Your, your basic uh, characteristics of life, breathing, heart rate, right? All down here in the medulla oblongata, your blood pressure, your digestive control, a lot of that autonomic nervous system stuff is all here in the medulla oblongata. So, um, we're skipping locked-in syndrome also. Okay, let's talk more about this uh, reticular formation because it is kind of a, a nebulous concept. It's kind of uh, tricky. So this is a, a functional group, kind of like the limbic system, which was kind of a little bit of here and a little bit of here and a little bit of here, all to create our emotions, right, and memory and happiness and those types of things. The reticular formation is kind of the same thing. It's a, a lengthwise down the brain stem from the midbrain through the pons and through the medulla oblongata. It's this whole group of neurons that basically are receiving input and output. They receive input from the sensory because right, everything passes through this area and they're receiving output from the cerebra. And so the job of this reticular formation is to basically collect all of this information and help our brain respond. Help maintain our alertness and awakeness to those situations, right? So the whole idea is to control our alertness, our awakeness, our responsiveness, right? And by responsiveness, this isn't, you know, lifting your arms up and catching a ball. It's just recognizing that there's a ball being thrown at your head, right? Because this is a very low level of, of control. This is not logic and all of that, right? That's all done at the cerebral level. This is just recognizing something's flying at your face, <laughs> right? That's what the reticular formation is doing. So again, it's taking everything that's coming down and everything that's coming up, and it's being able to process, process it to say, whoa, oh, okay, oh, something major is happening. We need, to, we need to be alert, right? It's not the, it's not the actual response, right? It's just being alert for it. Bless you. So this is looking at some of the innards of the brain, right? So when we think of the brain, we tend to just think of that cerebrum and maybe the cerebellum, right? The little walnut hanging out the back. But you see the majority of the complexity is in all of that, those inner workings, right? We have the complexity of the thalamus and the diencephalon with all of the endocrine regulation and homeostasis, and then all the basic rudimentary things that keep us alive at the bottom. I kept these charts in here because they're good. They kind of break down some of the things. Notice we got rid of a lot of the substructures on here, not so much for the cerebrum, uh, but for some of the other um, parts of the brain. I, I deleted some of the nuclei out of there just to um, simplify it. So ultimately, our brain and our central nervous system are working to provide homeostasis for our entire body. We want, we want to maintain nice, stable conditions so our enzymes work, so all of our chemical reactions can happen, so we can grow and develop and change and do all the things that we need to do to sustain our life. Those homeostatic functions include fluid balance, acid-base balance, electrolyte balance. There's an entire chapter dedicated to understanding homeostasis in AMP2, understanding how all of those things are regulated, all in AMP2, an entire chapter for it. So it's a pretty major, major thing, right? Our nervous system and our endocrine system work together for this. Nervous system is like quick, rapid response. Endocrine system is kind of a, a slow and steady, generalized, long-lasting response, right? So it's kind of like um, your, your nervous system is, is just going to give you a, a quick to-do list. This is your to-do list. The endocrine system is going to tattoo the to-do list on your arm, right? It's not going away for a while. Right? The, the commands from your endocrine system stick around. They're long-lasting. The commands from the nervous system are immediate and quick. Right? 
And, and it, it has to do with how they work, right? Endocrine system is using hormones, whereas our nervous system is using action potentials. Right? Major homeostatic mechanisms in our central nervous system include that reticular formation, right? That alertness, being able to respond, and the hypothalamus, right? Hypothalamus is our seat of homeostasis in our brain. This is regulating all the things, the hormones and everything. Between them, there's lots of little connections so they can kind of keep each other in check. So, um, this is because our autonomic nervous system is, is the, that basic automatic thing that's going on behind the scenes all the time. The autonomic nervous system is what is uh, responding automatically to all of the things. And so these lower level brainstem structures like our pons and our medulla oblongata override and control that autonomic nervous system, right? Um, so, and, and as we go through, we have a whole chapter dedicated to the autonomic nervous system. We'll, we'll look at how that happens specifically. So, um, this is just looking at a specific example with blood pressure, and we'll look at, you'll look at blood pressure in lots of detail in AMP2. Same thing with respiration. So I'm skipping through it because these are just examples of homeostasis. Same thing with fever. Okay, let's talk about how feeding can be regulated um, with our um, homeostatic centers like in our hypothalamus. So there's certain hypothalamic nuclei, right? Little clusters of cell bodies in our hypothalamus that control our feeding behaviors, right? Control actual chewing and swallowing, which we kind of take those things for granted because we do them all the time, we don't think about them. But chewing and swallowing are pretty complex, right? At some point while you're chewing, you have to consciously decide that the food has been chewed enough and you can swallow. And then once you push the food to the back of your mouth, somehow your body just knows what to do with it, right? So, so it is a pretty complex thing. All, again, regulated by the hypothalamus. Hunger itself, comes from the hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus saying, whoa, our blood sugar's low, or whoa, our stomach's saying it's empty, right? Or whoa, our proteins are being broken down because we haven't ate any carbohydrates or whatever. That's gonna send these hunger signals to your hypothalamus, and your hypothalamus says, okay, we gotta be hungry now. Let's, let's go ahead and feel hungry, right? And so the neurotransmitter called an orexin is the neurotransmitter in control and regulating your hunger and feeding reflexes, right? Sleep is another way, is another thing that's controlled in this hypothalamus area. So sleep is necessary for life. You need sleep in order to function normally. It is an energy restoration process. Your brain needs to physically shut down so that it can reboot and start itself up. If you've ever tried to never turn your computer off or never turn your phone off or never turn your tablet off, you get to a point where it's not responding to you, so what do you do? You press that start button in and you wait for it to reboot, right? That's exactly what sleep's doing for your body. It's resetting everything, reestablishing homeostasis. It gives your body a chance to ignore all of those other signals and just focus on itself so it can reset. It's very, very vital. Information on how we sleep, how it's regulated, all of those things, it's really complex still being researched, but it's mostly regulated in this hypothalamus area. You have to have it. Adults need seven to eight hours of sleep. So if you're under that, you're in a sleep deficit, right? And there are some people that can have fully functional normal lives with six hours of sleep, but that's very few people. Most people need the seven to eight hours. If you're taking a rigorous class like AMP, working another job, have kids, have, have a life outside of this class, you are in that seven to eight hour range and maybe even more. So it's super important. Circadian rhythms and biological clock is something that's regulated by hormones and it has a lot to do with this pineal gland and melatonin. And we'll look at that when we do the endocrine system. Um, again, we're going to talk all about this melatonin when we do that endocrine system. So, so, kind of, so sleep is hypothalamus and epithalamus? Yeah. Yep. So um, when you sleep, your brain waves actually change. Um, there's a couple different types of brain waves that we have. So our, our 
Brain waves are measured in you know, height, amplitude, how high they are, as well as frequency, how often they're occurring. So when you sleep, as you can imagine, your brain waves are nice, low and slow. The wavelength is very long, the amplitude is very low. When you're awake, when you're stressed out, right? Well, it's different. When you're stressed out, your brain waves are all over the place, right? It's kind of like how you feel. If you have that like anxiety attack kind of feeling where you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Ah, I'm so stressed out, right? Those <laughs> feelings, which maybe you get like that, hopefully not, but if you do get like that, um, what's happening in your brain is the same thing. You're, literally, your brain is spazzing out. The brain waves are all over the place. There's no rhyme or reason or pattern to it. You're just sitting here, chilling, listening to me, taking it all in. More than likely, your brain waves are just a nice, even keel of a relatively high amplitude so, so you're awake. The more alert you are, kind of the higher those peaks and valleys are, right? The, the more depressed you are, the more slow, uh, you know, it, it, the, the closer you are to falling asleep, the more those brain waves kind of level out. So there's a couple of, obviously uh, brain waves are measured, I should have mentioned it, on an EEG machine. An, ele an electroencephalogram is the machine where they kind of hook those electrodes up to your head, kind of prints out this little thing. So beta waves are those those, those waves when you're, you're awake and you're concentrating, you're awake and you're thinking, right? They're called beta waves. Um, theta waves are the ones where um, you're, you're more in a state of uh, kind of confusion or um, stress. Theta waves tend to be stress type waves. Alpha waves are the ones that your PowerPoint doesn't even say all of this. Um, alpha waves are the ones that are your normal awake alert. Um, this is like your normal functioning day-to-day uh, -day wave. So alpha is your wake, awake waves. Beta is your focusing waves. Theta is when you're confused or super stressed out. And delta waves, these are sleep waves. So children, and, and toddlers especially, um, are, have a lot of theta waves going on. Um, and you know this if you've ever interacted with a toddler. They're temper tantrums. They're crying because you used the wrong spoon. Uh, I'm trying to think of the most ridiculous things my kids ever screamed at me about. But that's because they just don't understand, right? They don't have the language to communicate. And so they kind of live in, a, in an almost constant state of chaos. For a certain time, and then once they learn vocabulary and how to articulate, right, then their brain waves shift shift to alpha. Alpha waves are what all of us have right now, unless you're secretly spazzing out and you're sitting there. I just don't know what, <laughs> right? So in your sleep, you're going to rotate through these different stages of waves. So most of your sleep you're in this kind of delta waves, right? But then once you move into REM sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep, where your brain's kind of spazzing out, right? Your brain waves change. You get into these, these kind of fits of REM waves, right? Which are kind of resemble beta waves. They're all, they almost look like a focused or stressed out type of waves, and then they calm back down. If you've ever had, I know like Fitbits, and there's other like uh, fitness trackers that can track your sleep. Have you guys ever used those before? Um, when, you, when you look at them, uh, it will show you your periods of REM sleep and deep sleep, and it's actually kind of cool. And if you happen to wake up in the night, uh, you know, it, it kind of tracks that and shows you how much quality sleep you actually get. It's a pretty cool thing. It's, it's one of my favorite features of the fitness trackers, but I always have trouble with the Bluetooth syncing, so I've gone through like eight of them. Anyways, this is just showing you kind of a typical pattern of sleep. When you when you first fall asleep, you have those kind of beta waves and then kind of shift more towards delta waves and then you wake up and you're kind of back to back to normal there. There are other altered states of consciousness which we're going to skip over. Um, but again, consciousness is is defined by the brain waves that your brain is emitting, right? That that, that your brain is is giving out. That's how you measure states of consciousness. Um, coma, stupor, things like that. So, vegetative state. These are terms I'm sharing with you, but I'm not gonna assess you on, so. Just so you know. All right, let's talk about cognition and learning, right? Let's talk about how we learn. So, cognitive functions are the actual processes 
that allow us to take in the stimuli and, and respond. The processes are the behaviors that we develop because of those things, right? So these are the actual problem solving skills, right? I get to this, this bump in the road and what am I gonna do, right? I step over it, right? At first it seems like, oh my gosh, how do I get over this step? What do I do, right? But once you learn the process of how to walk over a step, it's not that big of a deal, right? Um, so the processes are the, the behaviors, right? The functions are the, the taking it in and processing and uh, the actual kind of wiring that takes place to form the behaviors and form the functions. So a lot of this stuff is done, uh, actually all of it is done in the cerebrum. You have your parietal association area, which is your spatial awareness, right? So this is telling you, you know, how far things are away from you or how close things are to you. The temporal association area, this is things uh, that are more specific, like faces and details, right? So different association areas on your cerebrum are going to help you solve problems, help you identify what things are, help you to recognize where those things are, right? so that you can form a good response. Your prefrontal cortex is probably one of the most complex pieces. This is where that personality piece is made up. So this is where things, um, gathering uh, information about, about yourself. This is why some people are really good at uh, recognizing faces and others aren't. This is why some people uh, will jump at an opportunity to raise their hand in class and other people kind of shrivel up and will never be caught dead raising their hand in class. This is why some people like risk-taking behaviors and others don't because of the wiring that goes on in this prefrontal cortex, kind of what, uh, what information has been laid down, what kind of path, pathways have been established there. So behaviors for specific stimuli are rooted in this prefrontal cortex. Lateralization is the fact that different sides of your brain uh, kind of rationalize each other out. So there's a, there's a division of labor or a difference between your right and left hemispheres. They're not the same, right? We established that before with like Broca's area and Wernicke's area that they're usually on one side of the brain or the other. Um, but usually uh, what we have is the two sides of the brain interpreting things differently. Have you heard of that, your right brain, your left brain, right? That's what this is referring to, right? Some people kind of lean more towards one side of the brain being dominant over the other, right? And so that, that creates this lateralization. So emotional functions, things like that. Um, this is all done mostly on the left side of the brain. So um, this is uh, for those, those positive emotions. Ne uh, negative emotions are more on the right side of the brain. So if you find yourself being more of a pessimist, right, looking at the glass half full, then it's probably the right side of your brain that's dominating at that time. Right? So think about what you're doing with, with your hands, like motor-wise, and what you're feeling sensory-wise, and you can actually switch it. Right? If you're feeling like everything sucks and this is horrible, and I'm not trying to be your psychologist right now, I'm just telling you like a little trick that you could try right? if you're feeling a little crappy, because we all have those crappy days. Right? Because of those negative emotions being on the right side, try doing things and feeling things with your left side. This, or sorry, with, you, with your right side because um, your right cortex controls the left side of your body, right? So if you work and focus on things on the right side of your body, then the left side of your brain wakes up, right? And the left side of your brain is where more positive things are. So you just have to switch where you're touching and feeling or, or kind of light up the other side of your brain to try to get those other emotions flying. Attention is lateralized also. So again, attention can kind of focus and shift from like right to left sides of the brain. Language is also shifted from right and left sides of the brain. So different uh, aptitudes, different uh, language abilities can be more right-brained or more left-brained. So it's kind of cool. If, has anyone ever taken one of those tests that's like, are you right-brained or left-brained? Have you taken those? No. There's like a, a bajillion of them out there. I'm 100% always without fail, always 50-50. Uh, I'm like a freak of nature. I'm not one or the other. Um, weird. That's okay. We knew that already. Uh, dementia, we'll talk about dementia later um, when we talk about diseases and disorders. Uh, same thing with Alzheimer's disease. We'll talk about those as we get to the end of 
our central nervous system stuff. I want to get through all of the complex stuff before we dive into that. Language is one of our most important cognitive functions. So think about how complex language is, you guys. So not only do you have to hear, actually physically hear the sound, right? But that sound has to be recognized, right? The words have to be recognized or, you know, the siren, right? Whatever the sound coming in, it's recognized. And then you have to decode it, right? To bring meaning to it. And then to speak it is a whole, there's, language is so complex. And so language uses lots of specialized parts of our brain. It's a highly complex thing. Um, so lots of pieces, writing it, hearing it, speaking it, right? There's all, all different facets of language. So different areas of the brain playing a role in language. Broca's area, Wernicke's area, right? Broca's area, this is for the production of language, whereas Wernicke's area, this is for understanding the language. And you probably know this, right? Um, did any of you guys take a foreign language maybe in high school, right? Uh, yeah, I, I actually minored in Spanish in college. So I was, when I was in college, I was fluent. I still sounded like a white girl speaking Espanol, but I could, I could rock it, right? I, I could speak it. Now, I can understand it, but I really can't speak it. Like, you can have a conversation in front of me, and I will follow it, the gist, right? But I really can't form the words. It's because of the disconnect between Broca's area and Wernicke's area, right? And you might be able to relate to that story with a different language or with a different experience, right? If you don't use it, you really do lose it when it comes to language skills, right? Or maybe at one point in time, it was maybe a foreign language, but maybe you knew the words of a song, <laughs> right? It's, it's the same type of thing, right? And then the song comes on the radio and you're just having trouble remembering those words again. Man, I used to know all the words to whatever, right? And so some of that is memory with that piece. but. It's also linked to Broca and Wernicke's area. Aphasia is actually a language deficit. So that's a disorder linked to the language barrier. So either one of these critical areas could be damaged or um, have a delay, maybe not fully formed. That's just showing what happens in your brain when, when you're speaking and hearing language. Your whole brain lights up because there's so much going on with language. Okay, there's two types of memory. We're talking about cognitive functions and memory and learning here. Declarative memory is fact memory. So this is, you know, what's temporal um, summation? What's an action potential? What, what gates are open when the cells depolarize? And those are those facts and recall, declarative. You can declare sodium channels open during depolarization, right? But then there's non-declarative or procedural or type skill type things, right? Knowledge of how to draw, knowledge of how to drive. Right, skills that you can't just memorize. Right, these are things that you actually have to um, to do. And so, a lot of these non-declarative skills and processes become second nature. They become subconscious. When you're driving, you don't actually have to think about turning the steering wheel and pressing the brakes and pressing the gas. You automatically do it. Right, and so the, those procedural or skill-based things become part of your your unconscious. Right. Ha knowing how to read. You don't have to think about how to read, you just do it. Right? You don't think about how to write, you just do it. Right? It's a procedural or non-declarative type memory, which takes us to different types of memory. Don't you want to know all these tricks, right? Intermediate memory or immediate memory, short-term memory or your working memory, and then long-term memory. Right now, pretty much everything that you've ever learned in this class is short-term memory. I can almost guarantee it. You learn it, you take the test, and you forget about it, right? If I were to ask you, what does a Merkel's disc do? You probably don't quite remember the integumentary system, right? If I ask you, what type of tissue is in the papillary layer of the dermis? You probably don't remember, right? But that's okay, because it'll come back to you with a little bit more practice, right? The more you practice, the more you're solidifying those short-term memories into an immediate memory or a long-term memory. So immediate memories are stored only for just a few seconds, right? This is just... You're, I'm saying it now, you understand me now, but then when you get home, you're like, what the crap? <laughs> I have no idea what this is, right? That's not even short-term memory. It's, it's like a, a little second of a memory, right? Long-term memory is more permanent, obviously. So the trick is, how do you get your immediate short-term memories into long-term? How do you get them there, right? 
practice, practice, practice. It's literally like a trail through the woods. The more you walk on that trail through the woods, the more that path will be smushed down and walkable, right? The less sticks will be in your way, the easier it will be to blaze through, right? And that's, that's what studying is, right? That's what reading your book, doing your lecture notes, listening to lectures, coming to lecture, all of the things, practicing the homework, the case studies, studying for the quizzes, that's what those things are preparing you for, right? Shifting everything to long term. So forming and storing that declarative memory requires something called the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is part of your limbic system. And if you remember, your limbic system is part of your memory, and your limbic system is also linked to your emotions, right? And so having immediate short-term memories go to this region is important, and then shifting them by practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing sends them to that hippocampus so they can be stored for the long term. It's called consolidation. When you consolidate and, and push your memories from this brief fleeting moment, right, to a long-term solution. So different types of, of facts and different types of skills have different potentials for memory. So for example, um, the words that we're saying in here and the pictures that we're drawing and things like that, those have a higher potential to be remembered than like what shoes I'm wearing today, right? Maybe you've looked at the shoes that I'm wearing today, but you don't really care. It's not, it's not important, right? Those are, those are those immediate memories that are just leaving your brain and you'll never remember them again. They have a very low potential, right? Unless you happen to really like shoes, right? But this stuff, this stuff that we're, we're talking about, the stuff that you're writing down and drawing and thinking about, that stuff has a higher potential to, to be remembered because you're engaged in it. So how do we form it? It's not just about the hippocampus. There's also the cerebral cortex the cerebellum, and the basal nuclei. So what did our cerebellum do? Right? This was all of our balance, right? So this is where thinking about what you're doing, how you're sitting, are you walking when you're listening, are you, you know, 